question uh, because the story of water is a very long story and the book covers enormous amounts of ground. But I felt that the last couple of years have really brought water up the totem pole of political discussions. And even if you think about the last summer, for example, you know, we had uh, catastrophic uh, fires in the west of the United States, uh, the Rhine and the Yellow River left their embankments. Um, we've had uh, catastrophic fires in Greece and Turkey. So the world over, there have been events that have uh, just proven how salient uh, water or the absence of water can be to, uh, to people's lives. Something is changing. Um, in part, you know, the climate system is changing. That's not news to anybody. Uh, but also, I feel the institutions and infrastructure that we built to protect us from water events is also beginning to fail uh, with greater frequency. And so in a way, this is a good time to reflect on why that is, where those institutions come from, where does, in, uh, does that infrastructure come from and, and how do we move forward? And to me, uh, in order to understand that, we needed to look back in time and understand uh, how we got here. The book is, a, is an exercise in kind of archaeology of ideas and facts about water. And it goes all the way back to 10,000 years ago when we decided to stand still in the world of moving water. That was the time when we became sedentary. But in fact, you know, th there are many points at which, even in conducting the research for the book, I was so surprised by what I found, right? From the very first facts, which is that, you know, water, the quantity of water on the planet has been effectively uh, uh, fixed ever since it first appeared 3.8 billion years ago. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, you know, any sip of water that you take, you may be drinking something that went through the kidneys of some dinosaur at some point, um, all the way to this very important fact, which is that the relationship with water, between water and society, really takes a turn when we become sedentary 10,000 years ago, when we decide to build our home somewhere and have to manage the supply of water whilst protecting ourselves from having too much of it. Um, all the way then to the fact that I would argue in the book that very important political and legal institutions that our lives depend on today, you know, the legal system itself, ideas of democracy and republic, all arise not because of water, but in a context where they are shaped by the kind of hydrology, the kind of water that happened to be in the Mediterranean, you know, at, the, at their point of origin. Um, all the way then to, uh, you know, the stories of globalization of the 19th and 20th century, where, you know, the stories we usually tell are stories of a consumption economy and of a productive economy and of goods and services traveling the world. But there's a way in which you can trace the flow of water through all of them, even today. And so the book is really a way of revealing the presence of water in almost every aspect of uh, human life, uh, even all the way up to the present, even to the events of the Arab Spring and the great migrations that are currently, uh, you know, uh, happening in, in North Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and in Asia. A few things to say about that, about the question of whether there are examples from the past that really teach us something about how we should confront the future. Um, the first thing to say is that the question of who has dealt best with water can only be answered in context. One of the main points of the book is to demonstrate that the way in which we deal with water is ultimately not a technical question. It's a political question. And at the heart of it, at the heart of that question, is a question of values, of uh, even in some ways of morals and ethics, right? What we care about, what we want our home to look like. And in a way, you can't answer the question of how best to deal with water if you don't have a collective understanding of what our home needs to look like. Um, so that's the first thing to say is that you can't really say there's an absolute sense in which some society in the past has best dealt with water issues. That said, one of the things that I, I got from examining the story of water for 10,000 years is that the variability, the variance with which different societies engaged in this question of how to deliver water security, that variability is enormous compared to the relative homogeneity with which we, with which we deal with water uh, today. So if you travel the world from Japan to America to Italy, you know, we all stay dry more or less in the same way through dams and reservoirs and canals. And we, we've all engineered 
the landscape more or less in the same way. And that is the legacy of a very particular modernist project that started in the Western United States in the 1920s. Up to that point, different societies in different parts of the world dealt with water in very, very different ways. Um, one of the most uh, interesting and, and kind of surprising ones was the, uh, the way in which the civilizations of the Amazon uh, dealt with water in the 15, 1600s before you know, the, uh, colonial, the, the colonial project of kind of European imperial powers fully took a hold. Um, where they actually domesticated the entire environment. It was a full integration of an urban society within the forest, uh, creating landscape like no other, and one that we haven't seen ever, ever since. So in the past, there are a number of examples of societies that have dealt with water on the landscape in remarkably different ways than we deal with it today. But the main lesson that we learn from all of them is not the technique, it's not the engineering, is the fact that they wrestled with the politics of water, with where water fits at the heart of their political project. Water always wins. It's a dynamic relationship where every time we take a step, the landscape and the climate system in a way respond. And so, you know, for example, there may be a river that floods like the Yellow River or the Rhine in Germany. And our response, our first response is of course to build embankments and levees and try to contain the force of water. But the result of that first step in engineering then is people move under the shadows of those embankments and levees and start building cities and farm them until eventually that solution fails, right? So there's some catastrophic event happens inevitably and we're surprised and have to adjust and take another step in trying to control nature. And then nature responds again. And so, you know, part of the, the point of the book is to alert the readers and alert everybody to the fact that you don't, you never really solve forever these problems. The security that we've enjoyed for the last uh, say century is an illusion. And it's a temporary illusion. And what we're seeing around the world from the fires in the West to the floods in Europe and in China is that that illusion is breaking under the weight of climate change and under the changing conditions of institutions and, and infrastructure. That's the question, is there some magical silver bullet that we can sort of fire and solve it once and for all? And the answer from 10,000 years of history is that no, that silver bullet doesn't exist, that the answer is a continuous cycle of adaptation and making sure that the debate about what we should do with our landscape is at the top of the public debate and in the heart of the public discourse. This is not something you can delegate to a set of engineers wearing some white coats in, a, in some back room somewhere. This is at the heart of our civic contract. We have to all come together and come to a, some understanding of what we want our home to look like. And only that way, we can both adjust to what's coming next, as well as accept the consequences of the choices that we make. What gives me hope? I think the book is actually in some ways a hopeful book, but it's the hope of a realist, right? Um, and so I think that the story of India is a very good example. Uh, where, you know, India has gone through an enormous transformation. The British first replumbed the country, particularly the Punjab, and turning the Indus in the largest contiguous irrigation system in the world, it still is to this day. And all through the subsequent independence and the, you know, tragedy of petition and the problems that happened between Pakistan and, and India, the interesting thing is that whilst most people worry about water wars, the Indus is a great example of the fact that two competing countries, two nuclear powers that have been to war three times uh, in the last uh, several decades, have still managed to cooperate on the Indus through the Indus Waters Treaty that was established in the 1960s. And so in a way, the story of water is much, much more often a story of cooperation rather than conflict. That doesn't mean that conflict doesn't happen, but in the end, you know, human beings always find second best solutions and institutional fixes to try and wrestle with this problem. Maybe because it's so important that you can't just hope that to solve it with war. You know, maybe people just recognize that this is a kind of so existential that it can't be just left uh, to a zero sum gain conflict. So in a way, the story of India 
is in some ways a hopeful story, but it's a story that's tinged with realism. There is no eternal solution in sight, but as long as countries and nations and institutions lift water out of the technical into the political and bring it into an arena of negotiation, the story of water over and over again shows us that cooperation is possible. And that gives me, you know, give me some, some hope, even in the face of the very significant problems that we face today. The book is intent at revealing things that are hidden in history, but there are of course things that are hidden physically and groundwater is possibly the most egregious example of that. Groundwater is, you know, where a significant amount of water resides today and it's in a way the infrastructure, the storage infrastructure that uh, nature has provided us. Right? Uh, one of the best examples of how important that storage has been is the story of the Green Revolution in the Punjab in India which transformed its ability to produce uh, food on the back of thousands and hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of bore wells that tapped into the groundwater uh, of, the Indus, uh, of the Indus system. One of the things that we've learned over the last 10, 15 years, particularly through satellites that NASA put up in space to measure the gravitational force of the planet, is that many groundwater reservoirs are depleting rapidly. Um, and of course, because they're underground, they're invisible. We don't uh, see them and people take no notice. But they're like a bank account. We're drawing money out of this bank account and we're going into debt uh, and we don't really pay attention. And the risk, of course, is that we don't have any substitute for that bank account. Countries that haven't invested in uh, infrastructure at the surface, countries like India and Pakistan, but also the least developed countries like Ethiopia and Angola and others that depend for their agricultural production also now on groundwater, may be facing some very, very significant issues ahead. And so that's why I think it's important, this, this concept, this idea that what is hidden, it's hidden physically, it's hidden institutionally, it's hidden historically. One of the most important things we can do is bring it up to the surface and make sure that people pay attention. There's no mystery to how you solve these issues, but if you don't pay attention, you may be like Wiley Coyote, you know, you may kind of fly out off the ledge several hundred meters before you realize you've overextended yourself and then you're in real trouble. Um, and so that's why I wanted to write this book is to kind of give this sense of, of revelation, make sure that people understood that there's water everywhere from institutions to underground and make sure that we pay attention because that's the starting point for any solution. The firm transformed my uh, experience on, on water. I mean, literally, um, you know, I came to the firm I had been a climate scientist before coming to the firm. I had a, you know, a career in academia. And then I joined the firm somewhat naively thinking, oh, I'll be talking to uh, private sector clients and public sector clients all over the world about climate issues. And this was the early 2000s. And there wasn't great interest in uh, issues of, uh, of climate in the way that, uh, that, uh, that we have today. But there was great interest in water. I find I found countless clients in food and beverage, consumer, uh, fast moving goods in consumer companies, um, mining, oil and gas, extremely interested in the in the story of water and the question of how do we wrestle with this problem of water scarcity and water availability. And um, as I started exploring this topic with many of them and with some of my you know, great colleagues in the sustainability and resource productivity practice, which at the time actually didn't exist, that came a little later, um, we discovered that there was great appetite to engage in this. And in the end, with the uh, help of the World Economic Forum and a number of other, uh, a number of McKinsey clients, we established a, a project, which is in the public domain called the Water Resources Group, which still exists actually which was about bringing analytic clarity to the problems of water scarcity uh, around the world and lift water up um, in, in sort of economic and, and, uh, and managerial terms to something that will be salient to the CEO. Um, and we succeeded actually so much so that then we established a water uh, service line and a water practice. So it was a, a very happy uh, time of my life. And one of the things, maybe the most important thing that I learned at my McKinsey time and you know, in some ways uh, that provides the roots for my interests in this book is just how important raising the profile of the narrative on what it was um, to making sure that people engaged at it at the right level. What I had to, 
even at the time, our problem was to extract water from the bowels of sort of technical concern and bring it up to the level of ministers and CEOs and, and decision makers. And in some ways, this book is, uh, you know, 15 years later is an attempt at continuing the journey to try and elevate the profile of water as I had done when I was at the firm and as many of my colleagues continue uh, to do. I also met some of my best water friends while I was at the firm. So the firm was, you know, truly a transformative experience for me when it comes to my, my journey with water.